from CBS Election Headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Charles Corralt in the CBS Newsroom, Bernard Kalb in San Clemente, Bob Schieffer in Mitchell, South Dakota, Barry Serafin in Towson, Maryland, Terry Drinkwater in Rockville, Maryland, Jeff Williams in Ayrshire, Iowa, Jed Duval in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Richard Threlkeld in Prineville, Oregon, Bruce Dunning in Cat Lai, South Vietnam, and Bruce Hall in Miami. Good evening. This was the day that comes every four years when the people of the United States choose one man to wield the greatest power given to any world leader. And it appears at this hour that they turned out in record numbers to choose today the next president of the United States. Despite rain over much of the nation, state after state reported long lines at the polls, some places so long that voting hours were being extended. The report seemed to put into doubt early on this election day at least one prediction of pollsters and pundits that there was widespread apathy over this year's election. Both Republican and Democratic leaders saw in these large turnouts hopes for their side. Republican National Chairman Robert Dole said that traditionally Republican areas of New Jersey and Connecticut were voting particularly heavily. Senate McGovern, uh, Senator McGovern's chief advisors noted a very heavy vote in Democratic areas, particularly black, blue collar, and student precincts. Just a scattering of precincts have been counted at this point, but the figures are President Nixon, 218,000 votes. Senator McGovern, 115,000. That would be 65% for the president and 34% for Senator McGovern, and that's with less than 1% of the nation's precincts counted. But CBS News can estimate now, on the basis of its vote profile analysis, that in Kentucky, where enough of our sample precincts now have been counted, will go to uh, President Nixon. His vote will be about 61% of the total when all the votes have been counted, we estimate, to McGovern's 39%. The first vote to fall to the first state to fall to President Nixon in this election night. We'll be back in a minute with more on the election story. Modern medicine can work miracles, but miracles can be expensive. So Aetna Life and Casualty has made it possible for you to be covered for up to a quarter of a million dollars under all of their individual and group major medical policies. And we were one of the first to do it. A quarter of a million for a miracle. We figure it's worth it. But then we're not your average insurance company. You get action with Aetna. Save your money at a savings and loan. Your money does more than just grow. A savings and loan lends out money for homes, and that helps communities grow. Correction on our estimate on the uh, final vote in Kentucky, where we say that President Nixon will win, the figure will be 65% for President Nixon and 35% for George McGovern, is the way we calculate it here. President and Mrs. Nixon were the first voters to appear this morning at the Concordia Elementary School precinct in San Clemente, California. And then they took a plane back to Washington to await the outcome. Bernard Cow reports. Some of the local people here at San Clemente turned out early this morning to see a couple of their neighbors vote. The first to vote at Concordia School, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Nixon of San Clemente and the White House. The president projecting an image of relaxed self-confidence as he makes his own personal contribution to the Republican slogan of four more years. They use a paper ballot here, the ballot the size of a newspaper. There are a lot of choices to be made. Among other things, 22 referenda in California, including everything from decriminalizing marijuana to controls on pornography. There's also the choice of a congressman and the choice of a president. It took Mrs. Nixon about three minutes to check off her decisions. At one point, the president, perhaps because of the unwieldiness of the big ballot, dropped it, the kind of event that is destined to be a footnote to the history written today. By the way, it took the president more than five minutes to check off his selections. 
a couple of presidential votes here, his and Mrs. Nixon's, about which there is no mystery. <laughs> Bernard Kiaub, CBS News, at Concordia School, San Clemente. George McGovern was in a philosophical mood as his 22-month-long campaign ended. He said, we've done our best, we've waged an honest campaign, we've worked as hard as our physical capacities would permit, now it's up to the people. Bob Schieffer reports. McGovern had only a few hours sleep at best after a long day and night of campaigning, but he appeared rested this morning as he came to a Mitchell, South Dakota church to vote. Bannering with photographers, he said that as a matter of good judgment, he was voting the straight Democratic ticket. There was little doubt as to how he marked his ballot, with at least 50 reporters and photographers in, around, and on top of the voting booth. It was perhaps the most photographed secret ballot in recent history. McGovern predicted victory to the last. In a short speech in nearby Dakota Wesleyan, where he once taught, he talked about the memories of the campaign and the people along the way. And as we would walk up and down those long rows of people who met us at a thousand different airports uh, across this country and along the platforms and the crossroads and the great cities of this nation. Frequently, uh, people would say things to me that weren't always uh, heard uh, by the press. Sometimes I said things that I wish weren't heard uh, by the uh, uh, press. But what would, uh, what would come uh, to me uh, from these uh, people along the way that we met uh, were their expressions of hope. And that hope, McGovern said, was to be a better nation than before. There has been a certain serenity about McGovern lately. He feels he has done his best, but he thinks this will be his last try if he loses. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, Mitchell, South Dakota. Vice President Agnew spent a quiet election day in his office in Washington. He broke it long enough to end his active role in this campaign in a voting booth in a Baltimore suburb. Barry Serafin reports. Vice President and Mrs. Agnew voted at an elementary school in Towson, Maryland. Agnew joked with newsmen before entering the voting booth. If I don't come out of half an hour, send for him. <laughs> to no one's surprise, it did not take Agnew long to complete his voting, one minute, 55 seconds. Outside, he was asked what kind of victory tonight he would find satisfactory. Don't make any predictions. I'm out of the predicting business. We'll just wait and see how things work out. What would be satisfying to you? A win. Any kind of any kind of win would be very satisfying. Looking back at the campaign, Mr. Wagner, what do you think was the determining issue? The governor himself became the issue rather than the administration's record. How would you define it? Well, no, I think, I don't think you can uh, categorize that on a basis of uh, what's the, the same issue controlling countrywide. I think different things, different issues affected different areas, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the idea that uh, McGovern uh, was criticizing the foreign policy of the country, which has never been done, I think hurt him very badly. Agnew left to visit his aunt a few blocks away, then returned to Washington, where he will join fellow Republicans tonight for what he expects to be a victory celebration. Barry Seraphim, CBS News, Towson, Maryland. McGovern running mate Sergeant Shriver, who was the last of the major candidates to return from the campaign trail, also was the last to make it to the polls. Terry Drinkwater reports from a Maryland suburb of Washington. Sergeant Schreiber went to vote in mid-afternoon. He slept late because his campaign jet didn't return from Texas to Washington until just before dawn this morning. Working to the end for the ticket, there was a little final campaigning at the polls. Schreiber trying to change a mind or two. Then, a delay for those who wanted autographs. On the way to the booth, a Republican worker handed Schreiber a sample GOP ballot. He and his wife, Eunice Kennedy Schreiber, already had sample Democratic ballots. No question about which list of recommended candidates the Shrivers follow. The vice presidential candidate himself took a minute and seven seconds to pull all of the levers. Shriver's four sons came along to watch and received a brief civics lesson from their father. They've been along on much of the whole campaign. Shriver said it felt good to be voting for himself. It's the first time that he has ever run for political office and had his name on a ballot. Shriver will watch the returns here at his estate. Then he'll talk to McGovern and finally to the Democratic Headquarters Hotel in downtown Washington for a statement. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Rockville, Maryland.
see the 73 pickups at your Ford dealers now. Politicians long have looked to certain areas as the bellwethers of how an election is going. These areas range in size from wards to states. However, throughout history, there have been three counties which always have voted with the winner. Jeff Williams, Jed Duvall, and Richard Threlkeld have reports on those counties. First, Williams in Palo Alto County, Iowa. In November of 1896, most of the people in this town of Ayrshire voted for William McKinley. And in the 76 years since then, they have unfailingly picked the right man for president. George McGovern has some support in this town. The people are mostly farmers and predominantly Democrats. Even so, Nixon is considered a favorite. However, the president does not have an overwhelming lead here, as polls show him having nationwide. Nixon gets considerable organizational support from Mayor Jody Smith. At age 20, Smith is the country's youngest mayor. A firm Republican, Smith seconded Nixon's nomination in Miami. He predicts Nixon will carry the township by about 60%. The farmers are aware of the Watergate affair, but few hold it against Nixon. They write that off as politics. Some are more concerned about Nixon's peace efforts. On one hand, they ask, why wasn't it done four years ago? On the other hand, they now ask if peace terms will really be agreed upon. The men don't like to say publicly who they'll vote for, but no one predicts an upset or a break in the town's streak of choosing the presidential winner. Jeff Williams, CBS News, Ayrshire, Iowa. This is Cheyenne fashion, this year and every year. Even feet that never slide into stirrups are clad in boots. The railroad built this town. It came west with the expansion of the late 1800s, was here when Wyoming was merely a territory. In 1896, Laramie County went for McKinley. Every four years since, it chose the same man the nation did. The place is anything but burning with political fever, few bumper stickers or billboards, and not everyone wants to talk about it. Nevertheless, there is interest. Voter registration is up to 30,000, a record. A recent University of Wyoming poll gave Nixon a two-to-one edge, and then some. Why Laramie County has always been on the winning side of the presidential votes is a matter of opinion. One official here says it's because the population is mobile and diverse. Some folks say it's a matter of chance, and more than one will grin at you and say, superior judgment. Jed Duval, CBS News, Laramie County, Wyoming. Crook County, Oregon, population 10,000, makes its living off its cattle and its trees. Either by luck or some kind of electoral sensory perception, Crook County is voted for the winner in every presidential race since Grover Cleveland back in 1884. And although Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one here, Crook County will probably vote this year for Richard Nixon two to one. And with good reason, Lately, the lumber business and the cattle business have been bullish, to say the least. But few voters are all that charmed by the Republican ticket. A lot of them we talked to would have voted for George Wallace if he'd been a candidate. In fact, presidential politics don't even come up in conversation very much. Over at Brownfield's restaurant, the voters are more interested in the jukebox, or hunting deer, or if it comes to politics, the hot race for county commissioner. So for whatever it's worth, looks like Crook County is going to go Nixon by a landslide. And if you want to believe what the pollsters and pundits are saying, looks like Crook County voters will keep their record intact. Richard Threlkeld, CBS News, Prineville, Oregon. President Nixon's so-called Southern strategy four years ago was hampered by the candidacy of George Wallace, who won five states of the Deep South. With Wallace out of the running this year, a key question is where his supporters will go, to American Party candidate John Sch Schmitz or to the president, perhaps. Roger Mudd, you're covering the South, and wonder how it looks to you at this moment. Walter, virtually every Wallace voter in Kentucky, which is the state we have our uh, fullest returns on, virtually every Wallace voter in 1968 tonight is voting for Richard Nixon. Uh, it indicates that uh, from Tennessee, the same pattern is holding. McGovern tonight is running about uh, two or three percentage points behind Hubert Humphrey's mark in 1968. Tonight, uh, the difference is the George Wallace vote from 68. We can take a look at our Kentucky uh, vote profile analysis board there. As uh, Walter has reported, the uh, 
ultimate returns show that President Nixon is the winner 65% uh, to 35% for Senator McGovern. Our uh, popular vote shows uh, now Richard Nixon running a little less than two to one ahead of uh, Senator McGovern. 38% of the vote in. The bulk of that early was from Louisville, Jefferson County in the third district, which is heavy Democratic uh, uh, voting pattern there. But now it's beginning to move toward the west in Paducah. But take a look at the Kentucky Senate board and you'll get an example of how much ticket splitting is going on tonight. This does not indicate that President Nixon will pull in with him all the Republican uh, uh, job seekers. Louis Nunn, the former Republican governor, trailing by about 200 votes. Walter D. Huddleston, the Democrat. In the uh, Tennessee presidential race, with 11% of the vote in, Richard Nixon leading George McGovern uh, better than three to one, that is vote voting from East Tennessee, heavily Republican. Ticket split also in Tennessee in the senatorial race. There, the Republican incumbent, Howard Baker, leading uh, redistricted Democratic Congressman Ray Blanton by about 10,000 votes, demonstrating again, Walter, that uh, tonight, uh, in the South at least, not everybody is voting a straight Republican ticket. Mike Wallace, how are things shaping up in the East? Walter, the uh, predicted voter apathy is surely not the story in the East tonight, all along the eastern seaboard, from Maine on down to Maryland, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York City, Baltimore City. Voters are going to the polls in huge numbers. In some areas, they say that records are being set. But we don't know yet what it means, because there are not enough returns in on our boards yet to tell us. Most of the polls in the eastern states don't close until 8 o'clock. It could be that voters are turning out to give the president the mandate that he asked for. It could be that the McGovern organization is turning out huge numbers of voters they promised that they'd bring to the polls today. We'll be able to tell you more about it in about an hour and a half. Dan Rather, I think you're starting to get a trickle of returns from the Midwest. Well, we are, Walter, and the story in the Midwest at the moment uh, is in Indiana, where it appears that President Nixon is getting most of the old Wallace vote in that state. In Indiana, 7% of the precincts reporting the actual tabulated vote shows President Nixon running uh, somewhat less than 2 to 1 ahead of George McGovern. However, on the basis of our own sample precincts, the president uh, may win on the order of 67% of the Indiana vote. Now, we give him a significant lead. We're not prepared to say just yet that President Nixon will carry Indiana margin in the state turns out to be anywhere near 67 percent, he may bring in a Republican governor in that state with him. There's a governorship open in Indiana, and on the basis of the precincts reporting thus far, the tabulated vote shows the Republican out to an early lead, and on the basis of our own CBS News sample precincts, the indication is that the Republican candidate for governor in Indiana may wind up winning uh, with about 59 percent of the vote. The results so far from a CBS News Election Day survey of almost 7,500 voters interviewed as they left the polls across the nation indicates that the anticipated landslide for President Richard Nixon appears to be taking place. CBS News has tabulated its results up to the middle of the voting day for each of the 143 polling places in which the voters were interviewed even taking into account sampling errors and possible changes in voting patterns during the latter part of the day, the findings tend to confirm predictions of a Republican landslide. The survey, in which voters are asked to fill out a secret ballot designating their choices and other information, is primarily designed to analyze voting behavior by various population and demographic groups. Uh, we'll be presenting those findings as the evening progresses. As usual, there are procedural voting foul-ups today, troubles with voting machines and that sort of thing. As a result, there have been court orders extending the balloting time by three hours in Butler County, Ohio, and Hudson County, New Jersey, and perhaps some other places that we haven't even heard about yet. Bank America, think of it as money. Money when you're close to home money when you're away from home. Money for unexpected things. And money for those times when cash, and only cash, will do. Bank AmeriCard. It's money in a more versatile form. Wind up a toy? Simple. 
except on those occasions when arthritis flares up with minor pain and its stiffness. For help, reach for Anison. Anison contains the pain reliever most recommended by doctors for arthritis. When even simple movement can cause pain, Anison relieves minor pain, and so its stiffness for hours brings more freedom of movement without pain. Minutes after taking Anison, the joy of doing simple things returns. Anison. We just have from uh, our vote profile analysis a CBS News estimate that in Indiana, President Nixon will take that state, and when all the votes are counted, it will be a whopping majority for him in the normally Republican state, 67 to 33 percent in Indiana for Richard Nixon. And now let's go back to Charles Kuralt uh, for some of the day's other news. Another F-111 fighter bomber has been lost over North Vietnam, the third in the last 40 days. Its two crewmen joined the list of American airmen missing in action. Both sides in Vietnam are mounting a furious effort to improve military positions before any possible ceasefire. Not much fighting reported today, but a lot of movement. Thousands of North Vietnamese troops are said to be taking positions around Saigon, digging in, stockpiling supplies. The Americans are stockpiling too, flying in hundreds of tons of arms, turning them over to the South Vietnamese along with the airplanes that brought them. We have a report on this from Bruce Dunning. South Vietnamese Air Force is getting some unexpected additions. Until a week or so ago, the South Vietnamese were not scheduled to get these four-engine transport planes from the Americans for at least another year. Now, suddenly, about 30 C-130s are theirs as the United States rushes to build up the South Vietnamese armed forces before a ceasefire or peace treaty limits U.S. military shipments. The Vietnamese don't have crews trained to handle or repair these cargo and troop transport planes, but at least they'll have the planes in case turning over new types of equipment is banned in a ceasefire agreement. The South Vietnamese Air Force, already the 10th largest in the world, is also getting more and more of what they already have. More helicopters, more fighter planes, and especially a lot more parts to fix all those planes. It was a sudden decision on the part of the U.S. to increase South Vietnam's Air Force by about 15% immediately. But the Army is also being built up, waiting for the day when the U.S. will only be able to replace weapons and equipment on a one-for-one -one basis. American C-5s, the largest planes in the world, have been landing daily in Vietnam, bringing in more and more material to keep the war machine operating. A ceasefire may be coming, perhaps in a few weeks, but the Americans are preparing the South Vietnamese for the worst alternative, a ceasefire agreement that breaks down, with full-scale war resuming between South and North. But an agreement still in force, barring the Americans from returning, barring them even from building up the already impressive South Vietnamese collection of military hardware. The South Vietnamese are not the only ones arming in the face of a possible ceasefire, American intelligence sources report that the North Vietnamese are still sending large quantities of supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail into South Vietnam. They may not have the sophisticated war machinery being given the South Vietnamese, but the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong will not be lacking in bullets or guns to fire them. Bruce Dunning, CBS News, Cat Lai, South Vietnam. The U.S. aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk has left the Vietnam War Zone. The Navy isn't saying where the Kitty Hawk's going, but she may be coming home after more than six months off Vietnam. 46 crewmen were hurt aboard the Kitty Hawk recently in a big racial fight. Charges have been brought against 25 black sailors. Another carrier, the Constellation, returned to San Diego today from maneuvers off the California coast to allow her skipper to meet with 130 crewmen who were left ashore after refusing duty. The long odyssey of Meyer Lansky is over, a flight that took the reputed financial wizard of the underworld from Israel to the one place he didn't want to go. Bruce Hall reports from Miami. The 71-year-old Lansky was taken into custody early this morning in Miami after being denied asylum in six countries. He hopscotched around the world for two days after being kicked out of Israel. During the trip, he reportedly offered a million dollars to any country that would take him. But he found no takers when the plane made stops in Switzerland, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, and Panama. He fled the United States two years ago to avoid charges of income tax evasion and interstate racketeering. 
Lansky was held on $650,000 bond. But only nine hours after arriving, he posted bond and was released. He was ordered to remain in a Miami area. Lansky's attorney said he was not going anywhere. He described Lansky as a sick man with no place to go. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Miami. We asked people if they would stop and help you if you had tire trouble on the road. Here's what they said. No, uh -uh, I stay out of other people's business. No, I uh, might cause an accident. Oh, no. Unless it's someone I know. Absolutely not. I never stop for anyone. Now you know why Firestone wants to put steel between you and tire trouble. With the Firestone 500 steel belt, the people tire, that puts two strong belts of steel cord right under the tread. Steel so strong, it can roll over road junk like this and keep right on rolling. Let Firestone put steel between you and tire trouble. Back here in our election headquarters, we now have about 1% of the national vote counted, and President Nixon has jumped out into an early and a long lead. 66% of the vote goes to him so far. 50, 546,000 to 272,000 for Senator George McGovern. That, as we said, is a 66 to 33% lead. A, uh, a two to one margin for the president with 1% to the nation's precincts counted. John Schmitz, the American Independent Party candidate, that was the party on whose ballot George Wallace appeared in 1968. He's got almost 10,000 votes and about one percent of the vote. CBS News is able to say on the basis of our sample precincts that uh, President Nixon uh, definitely will win in Kentucky and in Indiana. In Kentucky by a 65 to 35 percent margin. In Indiana by an even larger margin, 67 to 33. And that's the way it is up to now, Tuesday, November 7th, 1972. We'll be back at our election headquarters for our continuing coverage in a very few moments. If there's From CBS News Election Headquarters in New York, this has been the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Charles Kuralt. Live election coverage next on CBS. Uh